Hello everybody, this is Dr. Christopher White and today we are moving on to the second half of lecture 15. So we're going to be dealing with Paleozoic life, uh, the vertebrates and the plants. So I'm just going to warn you ahead of schedule, uh, prepare yourself for some really, really, really bad uh, pronunciations of uh, scientific names of animals. Here we go. <clears throat> okay, so let's start with the plants. So it's widely agreed that land plants started as marine plants that adapted to freshwater environments before making their jump onto land. Now, this sequence allowed plants to adapt using fresh water in a controlled way rather than going straight from the sea to the land. So you obviously have to, you know, if, if you happen to have a fish tank, and let's say you have a saltwater fish, so you have an aquarium that's full of saltwater fish. So you then go and essentially add a whole pile of tap water to it, fresh water. What's going to happen to those fish? Well, the answer is they're going to die. Because saltwater fish can't live in fresh water, and fresh water fish can't live in salt water. So it go it's the same thing with plants. If you want to have plants transitioning from a saltwater environment to a freshwater environment, you need to do it gradually. So the best model is plants started in the oceans, you know, dominantly as uh, the preferred starting uh, species is a simple blue-green algae. And that blue-green algae then moved from the oceans, where the salinity was at its highest, into lagoonal environments, which have brackish water, so a mixture of both fresh and saline water. So a mixture of both freshwater and seawater. Then from these brackish environments, once they're adapted to those, then they could start moving into river environments where the you know the water was you know one hundred percent fresh water, and then they could go from the rivers and lakes onto the land. <clears throat> now that makes sense because you know the the other option is the plants went straight from the oceans onto the land, which means they have to take a very very big evolutionary jump to go straight from a saltwater environment to an environment that's dominated by fresh water. So, you know, th this this uh, this stepping stone process going from the oceans to lagoons, from lagoons to rivers and lakes, from rivers and lakes onto the land, is by far and away the most logical uh, pathway that plants would have taken. So the movement of plants onto land had to overcome several obstacles. So the first one is obviously desiccation. So if you're used to living in water, well, obviously, you don't really have to worry about drying out. So as soon as you get onto land, well, air, comparatively speaking, is very, very dry when compared to water. So, you know, any kind of, uh, you know, water bearing animal, water bearing plant will very quickly dry out um, in a, air, you know, in, in air, unless it can constantly replenish its water supply. The thing, you know, exactly the same thing will happen to us. If we just stood in the middle of a field and just didn't drink any water, well, eventually we would keel over due to dehydration. So, obviously, the ability to, <coughs> excuse me, the ability to both retain water and to collect new water is very, very important. So, the next problem that has to be overcome is reproduction. So, Organisms that live in water obviously use uh, water to transport the reproductive cells from, you know, from the male to the female. Now, obviously, when it comes to being on land, well, all of a sudden, that water is on the whole gone. So you have to work out how you're going to transfer the male sex cells and the female sex cells, how you're going to get them together to be able to produce new young plants. So that's another problem that has to be overcome. And the third problem is gravity. So obviously if you're a plant, the best thing to do is to try and be tall. Because if you're tall, that means you're above all the other plants. You can collect the maximum amount of sunlight, therefore you can grow the biggest. You know, you can produce the most fruit. You can produce, you know, the most male or female sex cells. You are more likely to, sex to successfully reproduce. So being able to stand up above ground level is extremely helpful. <clears throat> So plants obviously need to overcome the problem of gravity. So think of a uh, an ocean plant. So think of something like a bit of kelp. Okay, if you've ever seen kelp, which is you know, essentially we probably refer to as seaweed, if you've ever seen kelp, well, when it's in the water, it it stands upright because the water supports it. As soon as you take the kelp out of the water, it's just a floppy bit of seaweed. <clears throat> 
that's it. It has no actual rigidity to it. So plants on land needed to develop a rigid stem in order to allow them to stand upright. So essentially, these very early plants had to overcome these problems. So they overcame them in a relatively simple way. Well, they got around the gravity problem by just not being tall. So the very early plants would have stayed very close to the ground. So we're thinking of plants like, you know, maybe mosses and lichens, plants like that. So in terms of reproduction, well, obviously, yes, they're going onto the land. So there's a lot less water around. However, these very early plants would also have stuck to very wet, swampy environments. So there would have been water around to allow the male and female sex cells to, to move around and to uh, produce young new plants. And then once again, if you're in a very, you know, very moist, very wet environment, well, in that situation, desiccation is less of a problem. Plus these uh, very early plants, I think once again, of mosses, well, they would have also probably had a layer of slime on them, which also would have helped them to avoid desiccation. So that's how these very early plants managed to, you know, get around these problems. So essentially the first plants would have been very, very low to the ground and would have been limited to swampy or you know, semi-swampy environments. So this diagram here kind of shows you the evolution of plants. So what we're going to notice down here is here's the Ordovician. Well, first thing to notice actually is in the Cambrian, no land plants, nothing. Into the Ordovician, well, during the late Ordovician, we have the first indications of land plants. And by the Silurian, we actually have the first you know, proper land plant, the first time we actually have a full fossil of a plant. And then as you can see, as we've gone through the Silurian into the Devonian, you can notice, you'll notice in Devonian there's a significant branching off of different plant species. So we get the seeded ferns coming up here, we get the ferns coming up here, okay, and then we get the uh, lycophytes coming up here. So you, you can see we have, you know, a branching off during the Devonian, so there's a diversification during the Devonian. And you can see these groups essentially, you know, in some cases they become less and less important. So you can see over time the uh, the lycophytes have become less and less diverse. The number of them has decreased. Okay. In contrast, we can see groups like the flowering plants here, which uh, make their first appearance in the Cretaceous. Well, they started off with rel a relatively low diversity, but since the Cretaceous, they have ballooned and they have become significantly more diverse and their numbers have dramatically increased. So, okay, so this kind of shows you, you know, plants through time. So the f most important thing to remember is the first evidence of plant plants occurs in the late Ordovician. The first proper plant fossils occur in the Silurian. And in the Devonian, we get this explosion of diversity. So that's, you know, most of what's happening during the Paleozoic. And obviously these Devonian groups carry on into the Carboniferous and the Permian. So land plants are divided into two groups. There are vascular plants and there are non-vascular plants. So vascular plants have specialized cells for the movement of water and nutrients. And these cells essentially move water and nutrients up the plant stem, take it to the top of the plant. You know, they pick roots, pick up uh, moisture and nutrients from the soil. And th these cells transport that water and nutrients up the plant to the top of the plant. Now, then there are the non-vascular plants. So these have no specialized cells for uh, the transportation of water and nutrients. These plants are typically small and they live in moist areas. So this includes the group, essentially is dominated by the group which we refer to as the bryophytes. Those are mosses, funguses, liverworts, and heartworts. So the earliest plants would have been non-vascular. And then over time, non-vascular plants would have evolved into vascular plants. So the earliest land plants make their appearance in the late Ordovician. They're probably small and they're bryophyte-like, so they're staying very close to the ground and they're living in very you know, wet areas, so very swampy areas. So we have um, the discovery of probable vascular plant megafossils and characteristic spores that indicates that vascular plants had evolved before the middle Silurian. So we have fossil plants from the middle Silurian and we have spores from the middle to early Silurian that indicate to us that plants had, you know, the plants as we would think of them had made their appearance in the Silurian. So we had something that essentially had a stem and it stood upright. Okay. So scientists have identified fossils of sheet like cuticle cells. So the cuticle is the outermost protective layer of a plant. 
and essentially it also exists on modern lamp plants as well. And we've also found tetrahedral clusters of cells that closely resemble modern spore tetrahedra in late Ordovician rocks from western Libya and other locations. So what's this telling us? Well, we have the first proper plant fossils from the Silurian. However, we have evidence, we have bits of plant and the spores, the reproductive cells from plants within rocks from the late Ordovician. So this is telling us we have plants in some form in the late Ordovician. However, we don't have the fossils. And if we don't have the fossils, we can't really draw any kind of solid conclusions about what's going on. So all we can say is with 100% certainty, we can say we have plants in the more modern sense by the you know early to middle Silurian. So that's, remember, that's a plant that stands upright. It has a stem. <clears throat> so the ancestor of terrestrial vascular plants was likely a green algae although no intermediate sp uh, specimens have been identified. So again, one of the problems we have is we believe that green algae essentially is the starting, the ancestor species for modern land plants. However, we're lacking essentially the intermediate steps. So we have green algae in rivers and lakes. We have these you know, very simple plants, these mosses, these liverworts, etc. We're missing that step between the two. That kind of intermediate species or you know, spe single spe species or species that essentially fill the gap between, you know, these uh, river, you know, uh, these wa freshwater living plants and these land plants. So that's a bit of a problem. But of course, the situation is difficult because these very early plants would obviously have been small. So that means they would have also been very you know, unlikely to fossilize successfully. They also, of course, would have been soft bodied, which means which means they would have been far less uh, likely to fossilize successfully. So we need to take that into account. So, you know, the reason we don't have the fossils for them is they are they were very, very unlikely to fossilize. However, we do obviously have pieces, possibly pieces of them, you know, so we do have some evidence for their existence. However, we don't actually have a full fossil. Now, even though we are missing some intermediate fossils what we can do is we can look at the biochemistry of the plant or plants and green algae and compare them to green algae and we can look at the reproductive cycles of plants and compare them to green algae and so when we do that we find the following the very very primitive seedless vascular plants okay so that would be a plant like a fern so a fern is a very simple uh, seedless vascular plant they have similar pigments Metabolic enzy enzymes, so they respire in the, the same way as green algae do. And they have the same type of reproductive cycle as green algae. So these very simple, very early ferns essentially use the same techniques to essentially uh, photosynthesize, produce food, and use the energy produced, and reproduce as green algae do. So that strongly suggests there is a link between these very early seedless vascular plants and green algae. <clears throat> so the evolution of any terrestrial vascular plants, that's a plant that has a stem so it stands upright, from a marine green algae requires some modification and this is a list of the important ones. The first one is, is you need those all important vascular cells. So the vascular cells as I've said transport water and nutrients up the stem of the plant they're also important because those cells are absolutely full of water. They're stuffed full of water. And so, obviously, uh, they are rigid. And so they help to keep the stem rigid. So think of a balloon. When your balloon is full of air, the surface of it is very, very taut, isn't it? Very, very tight. However, as soon as you let some of that air out of your balloon, well, the surface of the balloon starts to become squishy. And exactly the same thing happens with plants. So if you've ever had a plant and you've left it on a windowsill, you know, in, by a wind, um, in a window uh, at home for some period of time and you haven't watered it, well, what happens to that plant? Well, it starts to eventually get floppy and it falls over. That's because the vascular cells in the stem essentially are losing water. And so they're becoming less rigid, just like the balloon losing air. And so that means the stem starts to fall over. And of course, you'll also know that if you then water the plant, then obviously those cells will then refill with water and all of a sudden your plant will become upright again you know, after a few hours. So having these vascular cells is very, very important because they transport water and nutrients and they keep the stem upright. And of course, having an upright stem is important because tall plants get more sunlight. <clears throat> 
which means they are more efficient. These vascular plants also need to also need to develop lignin and or cellulose cell walls, which offer strength and improve protection from dehydration. So around the edge of a plant cell, there is a big, thick, chunky cell wall that helps to protect the cell. Well, it also helps to keep the cell rigid. Okay, so the cell wall keeps this keeps the cell rigid. It keeps it strong, so it's essentially it's protection. But that layer of lignin or cellulose around the outside of the cell also offers improved protection from dehydration, which is, of course, very, very important because, you know, obviously once the plant starts standing upright, it gets more difficult to get water from the bottom of the plant to the top of the plant. And so, you know, it's, it's not a super fast process. It's not like, you know, water gets lost from the top and it's instantly replaced. You know, there's always going to be a little bit of a lag time. So that means these cells need to have some protection from drying out too much. Also, there will be times when the plant may not have enough water to replace the water that's being lost. And so that means these cells, once again, have to have some you know, capacity to retain water to make sure that that dehydration doesn't kill the plant. So they can survive very short periods of time without water coming to the cells. <clears throat> So desiccation can also be further reduced through the addition of cutin to the cell walls. And cutin is important because it also reduces the rate of oxidation of important compounds within the cells. It will improve ultraviolet ray protection and also it improves parasite protection. So over time, the lignin or cellulose cell wall will also begin to incorporate a new material called cutin. Okay, and I said that helps to reduce the rate at which compounds are in the cell oxidized, so they react with oxygen. <clears throat> now that's important because obviously, if you know, if you're a cell and you're constantly making, you know, new materials, and those materials are constantly oxidizing, constantly reacting with oxygen within the cell, well, that means you've got to constantly keep churning out new materials. It means you're wasting energy. Having the cutin, on the other hand, helps to reduce the rate of oxidation. And as such, that means that essentially you are wasting less energy creating new compounds because the ones you make will last longer. Uh, protection from ultraviolet radiation, well, that's a, that's, a bit of a, that's a bit of an obvious one. Obviously, organic material that gets exposed to you know, uh, large amounts of ultraviolet radiation are more likely to suffer some kind of uh, mutation. You know. It's why we put sunscreen on. And, of course, the parasite protection, well, you know, early plants wouldn't have required parasite protection because at that particular time there were no insects scuttling around. But by the time you're into the Carboniferous and into the Devonian, there are insects around them. In the Carboniferous, they get pretty big. So, you know, having parasite protection, so having this cutin becomes, you know, useful uh, later on. So, also, they require roots. So, roots are obviously important because they collect water and nutrients from the soil and that water and those nutrients get transported up the stem uh, essentially by the vascular cells. Another reason that I haven't written here is of course roots are very very important because they anchor the plants to the ground. So just think about it, just imagine you know there's an oak tree and your oak tree grows to let's say 40 feet tall, okay? Well the root system of your oak tree is equal in size to the canopy of the of the oak tree so essentially however wide the canopy is of the of the oak tree there's a root system underground that's just as big okay and those roots help to essentially stop the plant from falling over and pulling itself out of the ground now imagine if your oak tree did not have that root system to anchor it well the weight of all those leaves all those branches would make your oak tree very very top heavy and it would simply fall over and that's it for the plant that's it it's done it will die so Having roots to anchor the plant into the soil is extraordinarily important. <clears throat> Excuse me. And of course, then later on, we also need to evolve leaves. So leaves are essentially, you know, in scientific way of describing them, they are flat, broad accumulations of cells, and they increase the rate of photosynthesis because these big flat, air, you know, big flat bodies have very, very large surface areas, and so it means they can essentially gather very, very large amounts of sunlight, thereby allowing the very efficient photosynthesis. So in terms of leaf development, it's likely that leaves develop from small outgrowths on the stem of the plants. Okay, so the Silurian and the Devonian flora. So as we've said, we have evidence of plants in the Ordovician. These plants were probably bryophyte-like. They were very, very low to the ground. They lived in moist areas. <clears throat> 
However, we don't really have any fossils of them. We have, you know, indications that they existed. We have their spores, so the sex cells, and we have little bits of, you know, what appear to be, you know, cell, you know, little sheets of cells that you know, probably came from them, but we don't have a definitive fossil. So when it comes to the first definitive fossil, well, what is that? Well, the earliest, the earliest known vascular plants are these Y-shaped uh, plants from the uh, Middle Silurian, and they're called Cooksonia. And Cooksonia is found in Middle Silurian rocks from Wales in the United Kingdom and Ireland. So we also get additional late Silurian to early Devonian species of Cooksonia that have been identified from Scotland, New York State, and the Czech Republic, oh, Czech Republic and Poland, sorry. So Cooksonia, you know, it appears in the Middle Silurian, and by the late Silurian to early Devonian, it's established itself, and it's covering quite a large geographic area, so it's become a relatively common plant. So Cooksonia plants were small, probably a maximum of about 10 centimetres in height, give or take a little bit. They had leafless stalks, you can see on this model here, and you also see in the fossil, there's, you know, there are no leaves on the stalk here, and you can see it in this model here. And they had spore producing structures at the tip. So these, these cup shaped features right at the top here, that's where the spores, the sex cells would have been produced. Okay. And these sex cells probably would have been blown around by the wind and that would have allowed them to have been blown over a larger area, aiding the spread of this particular plant. So, Cooksonia fossils often display dark lines running up the center of the stem. So here's a Cooksonia fossil. So here's the stem. Here's this spore producing tip essentially. And you'll notice within it, you can see there are dark lines. So these dark lines are thought to represent xylem cells, which are used to transport water and nutrients up the stem to the top of the stem from the roots. And so people have managed to take a very, very high magnification images using scan electron microscopes. And what they found is, well, they found this. Here you go. So you have a stack of cells. Essentially, these dark lines here represent a stack of fossilized cells like this. And these are xylem cells. Okay. So what we have here is we have good evidence that these dark lines here represent xylem, which is transporting water and nutrients up the stems of the Cooksonia plant. So we have, we essentially have these vascular cells that are essentially allowing, you know, water and nutrients to be transported up the plant. Okay, so we have a good start there. Now, it's been argued that Cooksonia may not be the first true vascular plant, as to date we only know it has xylem. Now, I'm sure you remember from high school biology, vascular plants actually have two types of cells in the stems for transporting water and nutrients. There's xylem, that's for transporting water, and there's phloem, for transporting nutrients, and I forgot the other bracket there for some reason, my mistake. So when it comes to Cooksonia, Cooksonia only has xylem. There's no evidence for phloem. So that's important because, you know, a true vascular plant should have both. So the first true plant that has xylem and phloem is a plant called uh, Rhinia. And it's related to and appears just after Cooksonia. So they're actually very closely related plants. They have a very similar appearance. So uh, Rhinia fossils from the Devonian, about 30 million years after its appearance, after its first appearance, show this difference. So here we go. So this is actually a, a slice through a, uh, through a Rhinia fossil. And the cells within the stem have actually been fossilized. And so we can actually see what's going on. So on the outside of the stem here, we have the cuticle. That's the external protective layer that protects the cell. Okay. Then obviously we have the epidermis, essentially the outer layer of cells. Then we have the cortex. Those are essentially the packing cells of the stem. And then in the middle here, we have the phloem. And right in the center, we have the xylem. And that's a pretty standard, you know, that's a pretty standard way for a stem to look. So this, this order of cells is, you know, pretty much on, you know, as we would expect for a modern plant as well. So we know with certainty that Rhinia definitely has phloem and xylem. So some people claim it's actually the first true plant. So both Cooksonia and Rhinia are what we refer to as seedless vascular plants, as they did not produce seeds. And we'll discuss that more in just a second once you guys have taken a break. So pause the presentation, please. Uh, get up, have a walk around, and go and get a glass of water. <laughs> 
Okay, so as I was saying, uh, Cooksonia and Rhinia are seedless vascular plants as they did not produce seeds. So they were anchored to the ground by something which we refer to as a rhizome or rhizome. And that's essentially a part of the stem that grows underground and helps to anchor the plant in place. It is not a root. Okay, so a root essentially is a specialized group of cells that are specifically designed for the collection of water and nutrients from soil. A rhizome essentially is just a bit of the stem that grows underground and, you know, because it's there, it happens to collect some water and some nutrients from the ground. And the classic example of a rhizome is ginger. So ginger is actually part of the, the plant stem that grows underground. So these seedless vascular plants lived in low, marshy, freshwater environments. So that means water wasn't an issue. They didn't have to worry about dehydration. And because the water was there, it meant that the spores, the male and female, well, it meant the male and female sex cells could move around between plants relatively easily. So over time, seedless vascular plants developed other key structures, so structures like leaves and roots. And now these didn't come along at the same time. It was a step-by-step -step process. And of course, you might remember that process is referred to as mosaic evolution. So, you know, one at a time, these changes would happen bit by bit. So this process took place in the late Silurian to early Devonian. And of course, once you have plants that have roots and plants that have leaves, well, once you get to that stage, you're going to have a sudden increase in diversity. So during the middle to late Devonian, the number of plant species, or should I say plant groups, remained the same, but the composition of the flora changed. So there was a steady change throughout the Devonian from small centimeter scale plants at the start through to very large tree sized plants, about maximum, you know, minimum about 10 meters at the end. So throughout the Devonian, we're going to see essentially the appearance of forests, or at least forest like uh, you know, areas. So this picture back here kind of gives you some idea of what the environment that Cooksonia would have lived in would have looked like. Cooksonia would have been relatively low to the ground, about 10 centimeters. This ground here would have been very, very wet. It would be very moist ground. And as you can see, you know, it's relatively low, relatively sheltered. So essentially it would have been a, a pretty safe place for the Cooksonia plants to live. Now, once you got away from the environment, an environment like this, essentially into areas of the crust that were dry, well, in that situation, well, there'd be nothing there. So we need to take a second just to think about leaf development. So where do leaves come from? Well, there's two ways which we end up with leaves. Okay, so the first type of leaf, leaf is a, uh, now excuse my terrible pronunciation of this, is a uh, microthils, microthils. And this is a leaf that has a single vein. So where do they form from? Well, here we have our original stem. This is the kind of thing you might get uh, on Cooksonia. And the stem isn't actually going to be smooth. There are going to be small imperfections on the stem. Now, these imperfections will actually increase the surface area of the stem and thereby allow the stem to essentially be more efficient when it's, when it's collecting light for photosynthesis. The larger the surface area, the more light can be collected and therefore the more efficient the plant is in terms of photosynthesis. So this means that you know these very early plants that had stems that were covered in these little lumps and bumps, they would have been a lot more efficient at photosynthesis compared to plants that just had completely smooth stems. And so this group of plants obviously would have essentially been more successful, they would have been more likely to breed, and so they would have made up the, the you know the large proportion of the next generation. And so what happens over time is these lumps and bumps begin to become more pronounced. Okay, they get larger and eventually they get longer. And then after a while, these these uh, these essentially these elongate structures begin to flatten out at the tip in order to increase their surface area, and you have a leaf, a single vein leaf. So that's one way you can end up with a leaf. The second way you can end up with a leaf is through, and once again, excuse the terrible pronunciation of this. Uh, you you have uh, megathiles, megathils, and in this case, we have branches. And at the end of these branches, you can see we have multiple smaller branches coming off the main branch. Okay. And so what happens is, is we develop essentially flat uh, webs of cells in between these branches as a way to increase the area for photosynthesis. 
So in this case, what we've done is we've ended up with a leaf that has multiple veins running through it. So these are the two different ways that you can form leaves. And essentially, <clears throat> throughout the uh, throughout the Devonian and well, throughout the late Silurian into the Devonian, this is the process that's going on that slowly leads to plants that actually have leaves. You know, these big flat areas that are very very efficient for photosynthesis. Now, once you have plants with leaves, those plants are essentially going to just dominate because they are going to be far more efficient than plants like Cooksonia that do not have leaves. So Cooksonia would have been very quickly crowded out as soon as these plants with leaves, you know, really make their appearance. Okay, so let's think about seedless vascular plants. So in order to reproduce, seedless vascular plants require water for the sperm to reach the egg, so for the male sex cells to make it to the female sex cells. And these sex cells are essentially on a type of plant which is called a gamete bearing plant or a gametophyte, gametophyte sorry. And so that's where the sex cells are located. There is also a part of this plant which is called the spore generating part of the plant that's referred to as the sporophyte. So this is the kind of standard fern you are used to. Okay, so the standard fern essentially has the spore spore bearing generation. That's where the male sex cells are going to be produced. So these male sex cells develop on the leaves uh, within these little uh, within these little um, structures. The structures will break, releasing the spores, and those spores will be picked up by the wind and blown over the surrounding area. So when those spores hit the ground they will germinate and they will grow into a uh, gametophyte and on the gametophyte you have both male sex cells on the bottom and female sex cells on the top and so what's going to happen is the male sex cells the sperm are going to be released in the gametophyte and they are going to swim to other nearby gametophytes where they are going to fertilize the eggs those fertilized eggs are essentially then going to develop into plants and those plants are going to grow over time to give you ferns which will then produce spores which will then be blown about by the wind to produce more gametophytes and so on and so on. So it's a relatively simple process. Now obviously they're called seedless vascular plants because at no point during this process is a seed produced. So as I say, the spores are released and fall to the ground. They grow into a heart-shaped gametophyte plant, which contains the sex cells. The sperm can migrate between plants, fertilizing eggs, producing a new sporophyte plant, which will then release new spores. Obviously, there's a problem. If there's no water, the sperm cannot swim between plants, and the sperm will very quickly dry out. So this means that these seedless vascular plants are only limited to environments where there is sufficient water to allow the sperm to swim from one uh, gametophyte to another. So in the late Devonian, we have essentially a significant improvement in plant reproduction. So this is when we see the first seed producing ferns. So these are the gymnosperms. These are flowerless plants, but they produce male and female cones. So think of a pine cone. So the male pine cone releases pollen, and the pollen contains the male sex cells, the sperm. And the pollen is very, very good because it has a wax coating on the outside that helps to protect the sperm in the middle. So that gets around the problem of the sperm drying out if there's no water. So the male cones will essentially release the sperm, release the, uh, should I say, sorry, release the pollen, and the pollen will get blown about by the wind over the surrounding area. And essentially, the, this works on blind luck. So essentially, the, the trees are going to release huge quantities of pollen, and only a few of those pollen grains will happen to land on a female cone. And when these pollen grains land on the female cone, they develop a little tube. That essentially attaches the uh, the male the the uh, the pollen to the uh, the ovule the female sex cell, and it allows the sperm to move into the ovule where it will fertilize the female sex cell, producing essentially uh, an egg, and the resulting embryonic seeds are then dropped and released into the environment, that grow into new plants and so on. So chances are you've actually seen the male cones. So when you've been walking around any kind of area that's had pine trees, obviously you will have seen the female cones. They're very, very easy to, to spot. 
But there's a very good chance that as you're walking around, you also spotted kind of some much smaller cones that looked a bit weird and almost deformed, if I want to a better way of describing them. And uh, those would be the male cones. So they're nowhere near as big as the female ones, and they're nowhere near, nowhere near as nice looking. But if you keep your eyes out for them, you know, if you're in a, an area that's rich in pine trees, you will actually see them on the ground. So as you can see, this is a far more efficient way of doing things. So the sperm are in this wax coating. That means they can survive in areas where they don't have a whole lot of water. And the seed itself that's produced will also have its own coating. So the seed can be dropped by the plant. It can land on the ground and it can sit there for a while. It can wait until there's a period of heavy rain, at which point it can then germinate to produce a new plant. So as you can see, what we have here is we have a pretty significant step forward in plant reproduction. All of a sudden, these plants no longer really need to be in, in wetland areas. So now these gymnosperms can start to push out into the surrounding environment, into these dry areas that the seedless vascular plants would not have been capable of colonizing. So did we just go from seedless vascular plants to gymnosperms? The answer is no. So there's actually a couple of intermediate stages. So the first intermediate stage is a type of plant, well, a group of plants that refer to, that have a process called heterospory. So heterosporic plants produce two types of spores, so a male and a female. So one large female uh, spore and one large male spore. And when they are released, they produce female and male gamete bearing plants. So essentially what we have here, what we have is a situation like this. So the spores are released, but the gamete that's produced doesn't have male and female cells in it. It has either male or female cells. So essentially what we have is we have the sexual dimorphism that we begin to see here with the different, you know, meth well, essentially with the male cone and the female cone. So, you know, there's an intermediate step essentially where we have the type of reproduction we're getting seedless vascular plants, but we're beginning to see the divergence that's producing, you know, structures that, you know, specifically produce male cells and structures that specifically produce female reproductive cells. And the earliest known heterosporic plant makes its appearance in the early Devonian. And I'm not going to try and pronounce that name because I would muck it up terribly. <clears throat> so these heterosporic plants were followed by the uh, pro uh, gymnosperm. So these were, once again, a precursor step to proper gymnosperms. And these are plants that have flowerless seeding plant morphology and seedless vascular plant style reproduction. So these plants essentially start producing male and female cones, but the spores that are released from these cones will go on to form gametophytes on the ground, which will then grow into new plants. So once again, you can see we're almost there. By that point, we have these male and female distinct structures. We, they form these distinct cone shapes, and it's just a, a short step from that point on to actually evolve to give us gymnosperms. So, okay, so by the late Carboniferous and into the, per well, by the Carboniferous into the Permian, we have, you know, the plants are well established. We have the seedless vascular plants and we have the gymnosperms. So the flora of the Carboniferous coal forming swamps was dominated by seedless vascular plants. So if you remember when we're talking about the Paleozoic Earth history, in North America and Europe especially, um, there was a period where we had lots and lots of swampy areas being produced by, you know, very rapidly falling, rising, uh, rapidly changing sea levels. Sea levels going up and down and up and down. So areas of the crust were being inundated and then, you know, being covered over by seawater. Then sea level drops, they were just, you know, swampy again. Then they got inundated by seawater again. And do you remember, you might remember the term cyclotherms. And that's because during the Carboniferous and into the early Permian, we have lots of glaciation on Gondwana. Gondwana sat over the South Pole. And so as the ice sheets on Gondwana expand and contract, that means the amount of water in the ocean increases and decreases, and so global sea levels rise and fall. And so coastal areas during the Carboniferous especially were very prone to being partially inundated, and so they became swampy for a little while, then they would become continental, or they might go into a fully marine environment, then the sea level would change again, at which point they'd become swampy again. And so the coastlines during that time period were very, very rich in these swampy environments. So think Louisiana, you know, think of the Louisiana swamps, and that would be the kind of situation that we were dealing with over, you know, huge amounts of the, what would have been, you know, uh, Laurentian and Baltic coastlines during that time. <clears throat> Excuse me. So these swampy areas were obviously 
very, very wet, and so they were absolutely perfect environments for seedless vascular plants. So they, seedless vascular plants were there in very, very large uh, concentrations. So obviously, once you leave these wet areas, well, then you're going to have environments dominated by the gymnosperms. So the early Carboniferous flora was similar to the late Devonian flora, and it represented a continued period of evolutionary experimentation. So plants are trying to find the best possible you know, shape, the best possible form to allow them to exploit their environments most efficiently. So by the uh, late Carboniferous, we have two main groups. We have the uh, lycopods, which is these groups of plants here, and we have the uh, uh, the sphenopsids, and which is this group of plants here. You can see they're actually remarkably similar in their appearance. And now these two groups of plants are actually still around now, so they, they've made it through to the present day. And these were the two types of plants that dominated the cold swamps during the Carboniferous. Now the examples we have now are only a few centimetres in size. However, the ones that dominated the cold swamps of the Carboniferous would have been metres tall. They would have been tree-sized. So the uh, the lyco uh, the ly uh, the uh, lyco hold on did I spell that right where am I uh, there we go that's a problem I've inserted an S that shouldn't be there so the lycopods that should be appeared in the Devonian as small plants but by the late Carboniferous they were the dominant flora in coal swamps and they reached a maximum height of about thirty meters so the uh, lycopod uh, trees consisted of a tree uh, limb free trunk with a few branches with palm like leaves at the top which formed an upper canopy so if you've ever been to a rainforest area what you'll notice if you ever walk around rainforest you'll see that the brand the trunks of the trees are actually completely smooth there are no branches there all the branches and all the leaves are right at the top of the tree and that's because those really, really tall trees essentially form the canopy. So all the trees are very closely packed together. All the leaves are right at the top so they can get the maximum amount of sunlight. And obviously, because the trees are so tightly packed together and the canopy produced by those leaves is so dense, well, it means there's no point to having leaves further down the trunk because they're not going to collect that much sunlight. And so this, essentially, this is the kind of morphology we see in modern large rainforest trees. So underneath the uh, lycopod trees, we have the uh, sphenopsids, and they would produce trees that were about five to six meters tall. Now these trees were multi-branch, and they formed the lower canopy. So why are they multi-branch? Well, obviously, if these guys are collecting the vast majority of the light, any light that comes down, well, any plants that are down below those trees, they have to try and maximize the chance of catching that light. And so these plants, like the sphenopsids, they develop lots and lots of branches with lots and lots of leaves to try and maximize their potential for, for getting any light that makes it through this upper canopy. Now, obviously, underneath these sphenopsids, there would have been a thick ground cover of much smaller seedless vascular plants and also seed producing ferns, so the gymnosperms as well. So the largest uh, plants in the coal swamps uh, were a group of tall gymnosperm trees, okay, uh, called uh, the chordates or the cardates, and they grew up to 50 meters in height, so they were extremely large. There was also another plant which was very common at the time, it's a plant called uh, Glossopterus, and that reached a height of about, about 30 meters. And Glossopterus covered a range of environments from swampy areas to temperate environments. So the kind of environment that we have now, kind of a damp soil environment. So the kind of environment you'd expect to find a tree, you know, like an oak tree, for instance. So Glossopterus was extremely widespread. And it was so widespread, in fact, that if you remember, it was one of the fossils that Wegener used as evidence of plate tectonics. So what we have is we have these, you know, these four very, very large plants that begin to dominate the uh, the swampy areas and the areas outside you know the areas around the swamps during the carboniferous and into the early permian so here you go so he, this kind of shows you the different plants so we have the uh, the lycopods okay once again terrible spelling there my apologies and of course as we can see they had a treeless trunk and they had a canopy of leaves at the top because they made up the upper canopy now they'll see these are about 30 meters in height Beneath them, we had a lure canopy made of the uh, sphenopsids, 
and said these were multi-branch plants. They had to have the branches to try and catch any light that made it through this upper canopy. So that's how they you know, managed to survive. And then mixed in with these trees, we had the absolutely uh, massive 50 meter size uh, chordates or cordates. So it's these trees here. And then when we went outside the swampy areas, we moved into areas that would have been dominated by plants that could have survived slightly drier conditions like Glossopteris. So the late Carboniferous floras persisted into the Permian, but the climate began to change during the Permian. So during the Permian, we begin to see a shift to a much drier climate, much lower rainfall. And we also see a reduction in the ice sheets over the South Pole. And so this means that as the ice sheets get smaller, it means that the coastline becomes more stable. So we, we get, you know, we, we lose these small marine transgressions and regressions that essentially produce those cyclotherms, which produce coal deposits. So they're gone. So that means a lot of those swampy environments begin to disappear. And it also, as I say, also is the result of these much drier conditions. And that's caused by changes in the air circulation produced by the formation of large mountain ranges as, you know, as Pangaea forms. And it was also produced by the fact that Pangaea was a very, very large landmass. And so that very, very large landmass would have had a very, very dry core region. So any kind of swampy deposits in that, in that core region would have dried out. So as you move from the Carboniferous into the Middle and Late Permian, we begin to see lots of these, you know, large uh, seedless vascular plants and gymnosperms beginning to die out. So by the end of the Permian, uh, the chordates are extinct, they're gone. The uh, lycopods and these phenopsids were limited to small creeping forms like the ones we saw right here and here. So they had become centimetre sized again. However, gymnosperms with spe had specializations for living in warmer and drier climates, plants that essentially would evolve from organisms like Glossopteris, well, they had the opportunity to now diversify and begin to spread out. And so what we begin to see is we see as we go into the middle to late Permian, into the Triassic, we begin to see that you know, plant life on the continents is dominated by these gymnosperms. Essentially, these seed-producing ferns begin to take over and become by far and away the most dominant plant life out there. Okay, so this then brings us on to the vertebrates. So we're done with plants, now let's go on to animals. <clears throat> so, all right, so the vertebrates. Well, in order to be a vertebrate, you have to have a spine. That's the, you know, the base, basic definition in order to be considered a vertebrate. So the group that in, well the group uh, chordata which includes the organisms which refer to as chordates are species that for at least part of their life cycle have what's referred to as a notochord which is a, a dorsal hollow nerve cord and they also will have gills so we are members of the order chordata okay so at some point during our during our development in the womb we will have a notochord and for a very short period of time, we will have gill-like structures on the side of our bodies. Now, obviously, they disappear as we evolve in the womb. But for a short period of time, there are gill-like structures there. So vertebrates are animals with backbones. And they are a subphylum of chordata. So as chordates are soft-bodied, there are very few fossils of them. So we know relatively little about their early history. So the basic model we have for the chordates is this, and it's a bit of a complex model. You can actually see I've only you can see the multiple numbers here. I've picked out the most important ones. If you go to this uh, this uh, link here, you can actually find the red. You can actually find this uh, diagram, and you can actually find all the the different parts fully labelled. So essentially, number two is the notochord. So num there's number two. So it's this structure running along here. Okay. So the notochord essentially is rigid and it's hollow and that's what helps to keep the body rigid it's the scaffolding along that runs along the length of the body that keeps the body rigid so then we actually have the nerve cord where the nerves are running that's number three that's this area marked out here in yellow okay and at the top of it we have a very very primitive brain so then we have a tail at the end for propulsion and then we have the gill slits essentially located here in a region where we have lots and lots of uh, 
blood vessel density to allow the oxygen to move into the bloodstream to be transported around the body to keep all the cells alive. So, you know, when you look at it, you can see it's, you know, it's a very, very primitive fish, essentially. So we therefore also know very we, we therefore also know very little about the early evolution of the subphylum vertebrata because well we don't have many fossils of the very early chordates and we know we come from the chordate so unfortunately that means we have very few fossils of the very early vertebrates as well however once we get a little bit further into the uh, group uh, vertebrata all of a sudden we begin to get more fossils and we can begin to fill things out a lot better so when the arrangement of cells in vertebrate embryos is measured, we see that they are divided by what we refer to as a radial cleavage. So the cells are stacked on top of one another. So there's only other, there's only uh, echinoderms, so that starfish and sea urchins and sea cucumbers, share this cell arrangement. So that suggests that the group chordata, which eventually gave rise to the vertebrates, formed from the echinoderms. That's the group that includes starfish, sea urchins, and sea cucumbers. So if we go to this diagram here, what we can see, this is the way the cells are stacked. So you can see this is a radial cleavage here. So the cells in the embryo are stacked one on top of another. Then other organisms that aren't the essentially parts of the group chordata or um, echinodermata have essentially what's referred to as a spiral cleavage. So essentially the cells on top will sit in between the cells below. So echinoderms and chordates also share similarities in biochemistry of their muscle activity, blood proteins, and larval stages. So that's another great piece of evidence that shows that modern chordates and echinoderms are related. And as such, that's you know good evidence to suggest that you know chordates are obviously related to echinoderms, we're related to chordates, and so you know the whole thing begins to fall into place. So we now have a path to vertebrates, but the next question is, well, how quickly did things happen? So fossil evidence and advances in molecular biology suggest that vertebrates evolved shortly, uh, shortly after an ancestral chordate acquired a second set of genes due to a random mutation producing this second set. So what happens is, is through blind luck, there's a, a mutation and a chordate is essentially produced that has double the amount of genetic material of the other chordates. And so this doubling of the amount of genetic material essentially acts as a uh, advantage, an evolutionary advantage, and it allows it to outcompete the other chordates around it, therefore, thereby increasing its you know, chances of successfully reproducing, and so its genes get passed on to the next generation. And so this appears to be what we think happened, and we, we this hypothesis is based on what's referred to as genetic dating. So what we can do is we can go back through the genetic, you know, the DNA of you know related species, and we can slowly but surely through by taking by going back step by step we can actually see the changes in the dna through time as we work our way down what we notice is when we come to the chordates we suddenly see that there is a, some a group of chordates that has you know, about half the amount of genetic material of the others and so that would suggest that there was some kind of event some kind of mutation that took place that meant that this you know later group of chordates suddenly developed you know suddenly gained or you know double the amount of genetic material and that was an evolutionary advantage and that then led to the formation of the vertebrates now it should be pointed out that not all scientists accept this hypothesis and there's still a lot of argument about it so this is at the moment a best guess you know it's a, it's a real hypothesis some evidence to support it but we cannot be totally sure okay so once we have organisms that have a vertebrae we've ended up with the fish so the fish are the most primitive of the vertebrates and their first appearance is a little uncertain we have pieces of what may be vertebrae and they've been reported from lower Cambrian rocks in China so it's thought that they belonged to a class of jawless, jawless fish which is called the uh, agantha so uh, no sorry I think I pronounced that wrong agantha my, my mistake I do apologize so uh, the group agantha 
essentially. Um, uh, sorry, where are we? I lost my place there. I do apologise. So we're certain that we have fish uh, by the Upper Cambrian. Okay, and we have uh, remains, actual fossils of these fish that have been identified from the Deadwood Formation in Wyoming. So we believe that we had these very early primitive fish, uh, Agnatha, making their appearance in the Lower Cambrian, but we only have bits and pieces. So we don't have a complete fossil. However, by the time we're into the Upper Cambrian, we do have a complete fossil. So we know we definitely had fish, very primitive fish, by the Upper Cambrian. So the evidence that we have uh, consists of uh, phosphatic scales and plates belonging to uh, cripes, here we go, uh, Anatopolis, a primitive uh, Agnatha, uh, which have been recovered. So this material from the Deadwood Formation essentially consists of scales and plates belonging to this very early primitive fish. So this diagram here kind of summarizes the broad fish groups Okay, and so you can see we have the lobe finned fish. Now they make it through to the present day. They're going to make their first appearance around the Silurian Devonian boundary. We have the cartilaginous fish, that's the group that includes sharks. They're also going to make their appearance sometime around the Silurian Devonian boundary. And we have the ray finned fish, that's the vast majority of all fish. They're going to make their appearance sometime in the Devonian. And then we have these three groups here the ostracoderms, the uh, Acanthodines and the placoderms, they as you can see make their appearance during the Paleozoic, but they don't make it past the Permo-Triassic boundary in the case of these two groups here. And the Ostracoderms, as you can see, that well, they make their appearance in the late Cambrian, so the earliest fish, and they're gone by the Devonian Carboniferous boundary. So you can see all of this is summarized in this table here, and it even gives you a few living examples, you know, which you can quickly Google if you want to. Okay, so to date, all known Cambrian and Ordovician fish have come from near shore shelf sediments, with the earliest freshwater fish occurring in the Silurian. So, this does not prove that fish first evolved in the oceans, but it supports the idea. So, you know, the evidence suggests that fish first formed in the oceans, then moved into rivers. But we can't be 100% certain about that. It could just be that there are very early fish fossils from river environments. We just haven't found them yet. So the most primitive of the uh, Agnatha are what, a group of fish which are referred to as the ostracoderms or the bony skinned fish. So they're a group of armoured jawless fish that appear in the late Cambrian and they reach their peak in the Silurian and the Devonian, and then they die out. So the ostracoderms seem to have primarily fed on small pieces of food that they sucked off the seafloor. Because remember, they don't have a jaw, they don't have teeth. All they do is they have the capacity to just pull material into their body. So they will essentially just you know, sucked in whatever they could possibly get. So the problem with fish like this is, of course, they can only, you know, essentially suck in whatever food they can possibly you know they can they can get so obviously what you really want if you want to be efficient is you want something that allows you to bite off pieces of food off larger items and so what you really want is a jaw so just a quick discussion about the basic ostracoderm body they typically had a armor plated head very often they had a, a single spine or sets of spines coming off the back probably for some kind of defense the skulls themselves, the, the heads were often tapering to a point, probably to allow for improved movement through the water. The middle and, and tail were um, very heavy skin, but they weren't, you know, bony. And you can see that in terms of the tail, the lower part of the tail, the lower fluke, is often overdeveloped when compared to the upper fluke. In terms of the fins on the side for steering, they were part of the solid uh, bony skin and so essentially that this fish would have been very laborious when it tried to turn it would not have been you know it wouldn't you know wouldn't have been like a modern you know ray finned fish which can turn very very quickly to avoid predators this thing would have turned a bit like a super tanker it would not have been a particularly you know graceful uh, looking fish and so you can kind of see this picture without the text in the way so there you go you can kind of see once again these bony fins on the side spine for defense essentially uh, 
very, very thick armor-plated skin on the head, tapering to a point, probably to allow it to move through the water more easily. We have a, uh, a mid midsection and a tail, which are covered in very thick skin, and we have this tail, essentially with this very overdeveloped lower fluke. So the vertebrate jaw is something that we will discuss in a minute. Uh, when you've uh, paused this presentation, got up, had a walk around, got a glass of water, and had a second just to relax, and then return to me, please. Okay, so the vertebrate jaw is an example of evolutionary repurposing, so taking an existing structure and using it for something new. So research suggests that the jaw developed from the first two or four gill arches of jawless fish. So what the gill arches are, are they're little supports made of either bone or cartilage that keep the jawless fish mouth open and gills separated. So we're going to jump and you're going to see the structure here. So this is the basic setup for the jawless fish. You can see you have these uh, supports and they're keeping the mouth open, but they're also keeping the gills separated. So if they weren't here, that could mean that the, essentially the flaps of skin that make up the gills could fall over the other gills, thereby stopping water from entering into the fish to extract oxygen. So the fish would essentially suffocate. So these gill supports help to keep the gills open. They help to allow water to enter into the, into the body essentially efficiently so that the fish can extract oxygen. So, okay, so it seems to be this first two or four gill supports appear to be where things actually begin to happen. So, more advanced jawless fish develop joints in their gill arches, allowing the fish to partially or fully close its mouth. So if you've ever looked at a goldfish uh, in, a, in a bowl of water, you'll see the goldfish is constantly opening, opening and closing its mouth. It's doing this so it can suck in large quantities of water, which it passes over its gills. And so this means that because it's passing all this extra water over its gills, because it's got this pumping action going, it means that it can increase its oxygen intake and therefore it can grow larger. So this next stage is, is these skeletal supports begin to become hinged. And because they begin to become hinged, it allows the jaw to be able to open, move a little bit, allows the mouth to be able to open and close. That pulls water in, passes it over the gills and includes oxygen recovery. So these hinged gill arches would also have allowed the fish to pick up pieces of food that may otherwise have, it have been incapable of sucking up. It would have also allowed the fish to pull off pieces of meat from carcasses of dead animals. So essentially what happens is, is once you have this very basic capacity to open and close your mouth, the fish would then have the capacity to essentially gum, at, gum away at the carcasses of dead animals and be able to pull off pieces of meat, which it could then swallow and then digest. So over time, this capacity became more and more developed. So these skeletal rods became more and more overdeveloped, which would allow for a more and more powerful bite. Okay, And so as you can see, these skeletal rods essentially become more developed until we end up with what we would consider to be a proper jaw. Now then what happens is, is of course, these jaw bones here, well, they're not smooth. They're going to have you know imperfections, once again, lumps and bumps on them. And the more lumps and bumps you have, essentially, the rougher your jawbone will be. And therefore, essentially, what you have is the starting of start of very primitive teeth. And so, you know, these very uh, early jawed fish that had these very, very rough jawbones, well, they would have had, a, you know, an increased capacity. They would have had a, a better ability to bite into stuff to get more food. So they would have outcompeted the other animals around that would have had much smoother jaws. And so over time, having a rougher and rougher set of jaw bones would have become an evolutionary advantage. And eventually over time, they would then evolve into teeth. And so you can see how the jaw is actually a relatively straightforward piece of evolution, how we come from, you know, these relatively weak, relatively simple skeletal rods and make it through to a hinged jaw with teeth pretty quickly. It doesn't take very long. Oops, sorry, it went the wrong way there. So the first jawed fish were a group that occurs in the lower Silurian, and they're a group of fish which belongs to a, a class called the uh, Acanthodians. And uh, that's the group uh, Acanthidae. And it's a group of small fish that possesses large spines, essentially on their back, paired fins, scales over much of their body, 
and they had jaws, teeth, and a greatly reduced body armor. So unlike the... Uh, Sorry, just had a phone call there. My apologies. So unlike the uh, Ostracoderms, which had a very heavily armor-plated uh, front of their body and head, the uh, this group of fish, obviously, as you can see, were essentially far more modern in their appearance. So they were most abundant during the Devonian, and they declined into the Carboniferous and died out at the end of the Permian. So the Permo-Trias mass extinction finished them off. So they may be the ancestors of present-day bony and cartilaginous fish groups. However, this hypothesis is far from proven. So, you know, they do look quite a lot like modern fish, and so the assumption has been that they gave rise to what we would consider to be the, you know, the, the, the modern fish groups that we see now. However, the other jawed fish are a group of which fish which we refer to as the placoderms. And... Uh, their name means plate-skinned, and they evolved during the Silurian. And these fish were very heavily armoured, they lived in salt and fresh water, and they ranged from small bottom dwellers up to massive predators that were between about 10 and 12 metres in size. So, uh, Dunkleistesis, uh, which is the fish below, is the example of that. So, uh, in China, a new placoderm has been identified. I'm not even going to try and pronounce that one. And that comes from late Silurian rocks. So that's very important. So this fish is important because it has a jaw design very similar to modern bony fish and land-dwelling animals, including us. So this is very important because this new species of fish that we found in China has essentially the same jaw design as we do. That would suggest it's linked to us. The problem is then is if it suggests that we have evolved from that this placoderm here, well that means we no longer have a link to this group of fish here. So as you can see, it's a little bit uncertain which group of fish we're actually evolved from. So this group has all the, the appearance of modern fish, and so you would assume that we are linked to it directly. However, this placoderm here, on the other hand, has uh, design features in the jaw especially that would also suggest that we are linked to it. And so we're a little bit uncertain where, you know, which group modern fish evolved from. So we need to take that into consideration. So if we're just going to, we can just make this open. So this behind here is a, uh, a fossil of uh, Dunkleistesis. And here it is, you can see it was about 10 to 12 meters in length, and it was you know, a pretty fearsome looking creature. You can see essentially here are the jaw bones, you can see. Didn't really have separate teeth. The teeth themselves were just, you know, growths off the jaw. And you can see you have these massive, scary looking fangs, top and bottom there. And it would have essentially been the apex predator of its time. It would have been a pretty fearsome, fearsome creature. So as well as the three groups of fish that we've discussed, so the, the ostracoderms, the uh, uh, acanthod I always mispronounce this one wrong, uh, acanthodines, and the placoderms, the Devonians saw the first appearance of the cartilaginous and bony fish. So these are the two modern fish groups that we're familiar with. So the cartilaginous fish first appeared in the early Devonian, and today they're represented by sharks, rays, and skates. And by the late Devonian, we had the first primitive sharks around. So cartilaginous fish are rarer than their bony equivalents. So the bony fish appeared in the early Devonian, and they make up the majority of fish, and essentially they are also the group from which amphibians evolved. And they're exceptionally important in terms of you know in terms of evolution because you know these bony fish give rise to the amphibians, the amphibians give rise to the reptiles, and of course that then leads to the mammals and then eventually us. So the bony fish are split into two groups. There are the ray finned fish, and there are the lobe finned fish. So the ray finned fish are the type of fish that we are most familiar with. So the fins on the side of the fish are supported by lots of little bony rays that radiate out and they help to keep the, the membrane rigid essentially on the fin. So they help to keep the fins rigid so the fish can essentially turn. And they occur in both saline and freshwater environments and they comprise 99% of the 30,000 or so known species of fish. <laughs> 
So then we have the lobe finned fish. Now the lobe finned fish are, you know, very, very different. Their fin design is based on essentially kind of very fleshy, very chunky uh, fins. And within those fins, they have multiple bones. So that essentially they don't have the kind of the, the thin, thin, uh, you know, elongate ray bones of a ray finned fish. These lobe finned fish have lots of small, rather chunky bones. So that the fins are very overdeveloped. So the pectorals of the front and pelvic back fins have articulations resembling tetrapod limbs. So tetrapod limbs are actually four, the limbs of four-legged animals like amphibians and reptiles. So that's very important. That's already giving us a hint about which group of fish amphibians probably evolved from. So there are three orders of lobe-finned fish that have been identified. So the first group are the coelacanths, silento, so don't pronounce it so here. And they're a group of fish which we commonly refer to as living fossils. Okay, so they're one of the groups of fish that are, you know, evolved a long time ago and are still around today. So then we have the lungfish, and they can use their swim bladder to breathe air. So the swim bladder is actually a part of a fish that allows them to essentially to, uh, it's a bladder inside them that they can fill up with air or water. If they put air in it, then the fish becomes lighter and it'll rise in the water column. If the fish puts water in the swim bladder, the fish will become denser and it will sink in the water column. So the swim bladder is you know, very, very important for essentially allowing the fish to change its height in the water column. Now the lungfish have, um, being able to use their swim bladder to actually breathe in air and their swim bladder is surrounded by lots and lots of blood vessels and so when they breathe in the air it goes into their swim bladder and some of the oxygen from the air just um, diffuses into the blood vessels and into the blood you know that's uh, behind the swim bladder so essentially it allows oxygen to directly enter their bloodstream and so essentially they can breathe air breathe air Obviously, when they're in water, they have gills like any normal fish through which they breathe. So, then we have the uh, the uh, Coelacanthomorpha, and that's a group. That's this is the group from which amphibians probably evolved. So, there's the uh, cripes, another word that I hate, uh, the uh, Ripidstans, Ripidstans. And they're a group of late Paleozoic, two meter long freshwater predators that seem to be the ancestral group for the amphibians. So lobe finned fish have elongate bodies, so very long bodies, and they have these very powerful overdeveloped fins. And the fact that these fins are so powerful and overdeveloped means some people it allows some people to believe they may have been used for moving on land. So if you go to YouTube and you type in something like lungfish, then chances are you will find a video of you know a fish probably you know rolling around in some mud. You know the, the water's dried up, and so the fish, in order to survive, has to get to a new body of water. And so the lungfish can essentially they'll pull themselves over the surface using their typically their their front fins. So there's a lot, you know, there's reasonable evidence to suggest that lobe finned fish had the capacity to use their fish essentially, they use their fins, sorry, like limbs to propel themselves over the surface. So there are structural similarities between uh, those, between these uh, lobe finned fish and early amphibians, and these similarities are relatively clear. So if we have a look at this diagram here, to start with, we can see there's the basic body morphology. So lobe finned fish tend to have this very elongate morphology. The skull tends to be relatively flat. Same thing we see with these very early uh, uh, amphibians. Once again, we see an elongate body with this very flat skull. In terms of the limbs, we can see that, so this is the forelimb, so the front limbs of one of these early amphibians. We can see we have a humerus, radius, ulna, and then we have the palm of the hand consisting of the, uh, the carpals, the metacarpals, and the, uh, uh, the phalanges. And we can see the same basic setup here in these lobe finned fish. We have a humerus, a radius, an ulna, and then we have the bones of the hand, the palm and the fingers. So you can see that from an, you know, a design point of view, they are very, very similar. Minor differences, granted, but they are very, very similar. 
and we can also see similarities between lobe-finned fish and the very early amphibians when we look at the cross-section of the teeth. And we can see the teeth have a very, very similar design. And so when you look at the, you know, the, the design of the teeth between animals, that allows you to you know, link them together you know, through similarities. So, you know, so if we were to compare human teeth to chimpanzee teeth, we would see they were very closely related. If we were to compare human teeth to dog teeth, we would see, once again, very closely related, not quite as closely related as chimpanzee teeth. However, if we were to compare, you know, human teeth to the teeth of, I don't know, let's say a very, very early reptile, we would see that the differences would be noticeable. So the more closely related species are, the similar the design of the tooth should be as well. And so we also see this with the lobe-finned fish and the early amphibians. We see very strong similarities between the teeth. So we have a similarity in body form, a similarity in limb design, and a similarity in teeth design. So that's you know, pretty decent evidence to suggest that lobe-finned fish gave rise to the very early amphibians. Okay, so the amphibians. Let's go for it. So amphibians were the first permanent vertebrates on land, although plants, insects, spiders, millipedes, scorpions, actually the group arthropods, and the snails, the gastropods, had already made the jump. So, you know, don't think that the amphibians were walking out, you know, into a, a you know, they were the first ones on land. They weren't there. The insects, for instance, have been there for a lot, lot longer. So amphibians had to overcome several problems. The first one is, well, once again, desiccation. If you're used to living in water and all of a sudden you're walking around on the land, well, once again, the air is very, very dry compared to the, you know, compared to water, obviously. So that means you're going to dry out quickly unless you have some way of stopping yourself from drying out. And then there's the problem of reproduction. So fish tend to reproduce by, you know, essentially the female lays a pile of unfertilized eggs. The male will come along and essentially fertilize his eggs by essentially just releasing the male sex cells into the vicinity of the eggs. And, you know, the male sex cells have to make it to the eggs, you know, through the water. Obviously, in that situation, well, the water's now gone. So that's a bit of a problem. And then you obviously have the problem of, well, how do the young uh, begin to develop. So even if you can fertilize the female sex cells, well, obviously, if you're designed to have your young develop in water, well, you know, if you're on land, that's a bit of a problem. That means, you know, you have to go back to water every time. So you can't move too far from bodies of water. There's also the effect of gravity. So these animals that are designed for living in water have the added support of uh, water around them. So a good example of that is a whale. So when a whale gets beached, essentially on a beach, uh, the whale will slowly suffocate. Why is that? Well, the mass of the whale is so great that essentially the, the whale's diaphragm is unable to essentially work properly. You might remember it from your, when you were a kid, you had a fight with your brother and sister, and chances are at some point they sat on your chest, and you found it very, very difficult to breathe because they essentially they were stopping your rib cage from being able to move up and down, so your diaphragm wasn't working properly, so your, and therefore your lungs weren't working properly. So essentially, you know, that's the same thing that happens with a whale. When the whale's on the beach, there's no water around to support it, so the mass of the body pushes down the rib cage, stops the diaphragm from working, and slowly but surely the whale begins to suffocate. So whales, on the other hand, when they're in water, well, the water helps to support the mass, and as such, it means that the whale's uh, rib cage and diaphragm will work perfectly. So when these very large organisms, and you know the uh, lobe-finned fish are quite large, so when they leave the water, obviously if they want to be able to breathe, they have to have the correct body design to allow them to overcome the effects of gravity, because gravity is going to try and pull their body down onto the ground, and it's going to make it difficult for their rib cage to function correctly, for their diaphragm to function correctly. And then obviously there's the big one, they need to be, work out how to extract oxygen from the air using lungs. That's a pretty important step as well. So as you can quite clearly see, there are a few very major problems that have to be overcome. So the first model for the late Devonian transition uh, was essentially a transition from the lobe-finned fish through to the primitive amphibians, essentially via an organism called Ichthyostega. And 
the reason why we went for uh, Ichthyostega as the, the most likely intermediate species was because at the time, those were the fossils that scientists had to work with. So, you know, Ichthyostega was the right fossil, it was in the right place, it looked about right, ah, there we go, that's the missing link, done. So, however, there are gaps in the morphology between these lobe-finned fish and Ichthyostega. So, you know, Ichthyostega isn't, you know, a, isn't, a, uh, a nice step in the progression essentially we have the lobe finned fish we have the ichthyostega and obviously there have to have been several stages in between but at that time we didn't have the fossils for those intermediate forms so here we go so this is a, uh, a picture of ichthyostega so you can quite clearly see it has the very elongate body of a lobe finned fish has the flat head you can see that the forelimbs and hindlimbs are now developed essentially into a, a very crude uh, five-toed limb. Okay, and so when you look at it, you think, okay, that looks kind of like a kind of frog slash crocodile slash you know cross, doesn't it? Really, I mean, it's a you know quite a hybrid-looking uh, creature. Now, the one thing you'll notice is that the tail is still very very long and it's quite broad, so it's still able to be used for propulsion through the water. So you can see that this organism has about a 50-50 kind of body plan. It has limbs for moving on land, and it has a tail for propulsion through water. So, okay, so Ichthyostega was assumed to be the, you know, the organism that essentially was the bridging organism between the fish and the amphibians on the land. Now, we do have a bit of a problem. So we have uh, tetrapod footprints in middle Devonian sediments, that's 395 million years ago, from the Holy Cross Mountains in Poland. And we have additional tetrapod specimens which have forced an adjustment on the timing of the amphibian invasion. So based on Ichthyostega, we think Ichthyostega actually came along a little bit later. Okay, however, it would seem that based on the evidence that we have, there may have been some organisms that were tetrapods, they had four limbs, they were moving about using those limbs, and they were moving around on the surface of the Earth 395 million years ago, give or take a little bit. So we also need to think about uh, why legs developed. So it's a pretty obvious question, isn't it, when you think about it. Why did the lobe-finned fish develop structures which could eventually turn into legs? Well, the current explanation is that they evolved to make it easier for animals to move around in streams, lakes, and swamps. The reason for this is, is that rivers and lakes and swamp environments tend to have quite a lot of plant material in them. That means there's lots of debris. You know, compare that to a marine environment. On the whole, a marine environment is relatively debris-free. So when your fish is swimming around, Chances are there's it's not going to come against you know, come up against any kind of you know any kind of blockage anything getting in the way. However, if you live in you know river environments and lake environments and swamp environments like the lobe finned fish do, well, they obviously have the problem that they're going to come up against you know things like fallen trees and you know just you know piles of roots and those kind of things that are going to get in their way, going to block their path. And so the argument is is that they develop these very you know over overdeveloped uh, fore limbs and hind limbs to allow themselves to basically pull themselves over these obstructions and get to the water on the other side. Now the other suggestion is, and once again if you go back to those videos of lungfish that you'll find on uh, on YouTube, these environments like lakes and rivers and swamps, well they'll periodically dry out. And so that means these animals will obviously have to find a new body of water if the body of water they're in disappears. And so that's another reason for having these powerful forelimbs. It allows them to drag themselves over the surface until they can find another body of water to move into. So there's one issue when, it, when we discuss these tetrapod footprints from the Middle Devonian. So these tetrapod footprints from Poland were made in sediments from a carbonate lagoon. So a carbonate lagoon, if you remember, is a marine environment, so it's under salt water. So 
the basic idea is of course that fish you know evolved into these amphibian fish hybrids the amphibian fish hybrids lived in freshwater environments so rivers and lakes and swamps and then they moved out of those environments onto the land and that would make sense because once again just like the plants they're going from a freshwater environment so rivers into a freshwater environment you know the you know the, the continent itself well obviously it will be exposed to you know rain fresh water so that makes reasonable sense however these footprints from the holy cross mountains in poland are actually made in marine sediments so that's something that we need to you know take into account you know that's a bit of a problem so these footprints in the holy cross formation are rather cryptic i think it's fair to say you know they're a little bit different to a little bit difficult to actually work out exactly what they are so did the amphibians come from marine environments straight onto the continents? Well, the, this evidence would suggest yes, but logic would say no. Logic would suggest they probably came from river and lake environments. So it's uncertain is the, is the answer about whether fish came straight from marine environments or whether they came from rivers, lakes and swamps and then moved on to land from there. Okay, so it's been, well, a little bit over 20 minutes. So let's pause here. So once again, get up, have a walk around, go and get a glass of water, and please come back in a few minutes. So in order to move around on land, the tetrapods not only had to develop strong limbs, but obviously they also had to develop, you know, good strong mountain point mounting points as well. So, you know, imagine the situation. We've been discussing that, uh, you know, how limbs have become more and more developed. And obviously, they needed better and better limbs to move around on land. So, you know, you know as you can see, when we looked at this previous picture of, uh, you know, oh, let's uh, have Steger there. When we looked at Ifia Steger here, you can see they had these very big, very chunky forelimbs and hindlimbs, which would be perfect for dragging the body around on the land. However, there's a bit of a problem. You can have the biggest, strongest limbs, but if they are attached to a very weak rib cage or a very weak pelvis, well, whenever the organism tries to pull itself around on the on the land, it might you know break its rib cage or it might break its pelvis. So obviously, the attachment points for those limbs have to be you know equal in strength to the limbs themselves. So that needs to be taken into account as well. So there's an organism called uh, Acanthostega. And it's the earliest tetrapod. It's very common. And analysis has shown that its legs could not support the weight of its body. So this act, this organism actually comes before Ichthyostega. And when you look at it, you'd think to yourself, all right, this looks like it might be able to do it. You know, it's got the basic body design. You can see it. it's got the long slender body, very flat head. You can see the, the fore and hind limbs are very strong and overdeveloped there. OK, and you would think to yourself, well, this organism should be able to move around on the land relatively easily. Sorry, come pressing the wrong buttons again and again there. So it's a very common organism as well. However, analysis of uh, Acanthostega shows that its body and its rib cage, especially would not be strong enough to take the forces of powerful leg muscles. So if it did get onto land and it was trying to pull itself around, essentially when it tried to pull itself, when you tried to use its forelimbs for propulsion, it would literally break its own rib cage. So even though Acanthostega has all the basic design features required, it looks perfect. If you actually put it on land and try to make it move, it would be an epic failure. So we know for a fact that Acanthostega has to be before Ichthyostega, and it would seem to be a precursor step to Ichthyostega. Now, also in the same Upper Devonian sediments that contain uh, Acanthostega, we have pieces of bone and partial amphibian skeletons from uh, genuses such as Ichthyostega. Now, Ichthyostega, on the other hand, it does show strong leg development, has a strong backbone, a strong rib cage, and a strong uh, pelvic and pectoral girdles. So the so Ichthyostega has the basic design features required for moving around on land successfully. So it would seem that Ichthyostega is actually, because I am, there's me going the wrong way again, Ichthyostega is actually a very, very good candidate for the organism that bridges the gap between the, the lobe fin fish and the amphibians. But wait, there is more. So another strong contender for the Intermediate Species Award that bridges this gap between the lobe-finned fish and the tetrapods was found in 2006 at Ellesmere Island in Canada. So that's very northern Canada. 
So the late Devonian organism is called uh, Tiktaalik, and it possessed gills and scales like a fish, and it had a broad skull, eyes on the top of its head and a flexible neck. It also had lungs, a large rib cage that could support its body weight on land or in water, and those are all tetrapod characteristics. So once again, it had fish characteristics, so it had gills and scales, but it also had the broad skull, eyes on top of its head, flexible neck, lungs, and a, and a large rib cage that could support the body weight on land or water. So those are the kind of design features you want if you're going to move around on land like an amphibian. So on top of all that, it has the beginning of a true tetrapod forelimb, complete with a functional wrist bone and five digits. It also seems to have a modern, modified ear region. So, okay, we appear to have some basic design features that, you know, are working for us. So we have very early fish giving rise to Tixlick, and then that would give rise to organisms maybe like Ichthyostega. So when we actually look, excuse me, I'm going to cough again. <coughs> excuse me. So when we actually look at the development of the uh, the amphibian forelimb and hindlimb, we can actually see it here. And this is a very basic diagram. Now, obviously, the, the proper scientific diagrams themselves obviously have a lot more intermediate steps. But you can see the basic evolution here. So here we have a very basic uh, lobe-finned fish forelimb. And you can see over time it gives rise to other lobe-finned fish. And these lobe-finned fish, you can see the forelimbs are becoming more and more essentially overdeveloped, bigger and chunkier. Now, by the time we're at Tiktaalik, the forelimbs have actually developed to the point where we actually have a very big chunky forelimb and hind limb that may well have been capable of allowing propulsion on the land, probably for only short periods of time. And then Tiktaalik probably would have returned to the water, and that's where it would have lived most of the time. And then as we go from Tiktaalik, we end up with Acanthostega, which is the organism that we were looking at here. And then Acanthostega is followed by a group of organisms that would include uh, Ichthyostega, which is another, which is the organism we saw right back at the beginning of this section. So you can see as we go from the, the very primitive lobe finned fish through the more developed lobe finned fish and eventually into these fish amphibian hybrids, you can see the steady development of the forelimb, but you can see the basic bone structure remains the same. So we have, you know, we have a humerus all the way along there, we have the radius and ulna. There it is again, there, 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 and there. And then we have the bones, essentially, of the hand and the palm. Okay. Now, you can see, in, in this case, it's not quite a perfect intermediate step. You can see most of those fine bones aren't present. So, you know, this diagram isn't exactly perfect, but it does give you, you know, a broad idea of the, of the trend we saw in terms of forelimb development as we move from these lobe-finned fish all the way through to the amphibians. And so this diagram here kind of gives you some some idea. So essentially the, the most important part of the process, excuse me, <coughs> I do apologize. The most important part of the process essentially is this step from organisms like uh, Acanthostega and Tixlick, which are, you know, existing sometime around the same time. Tixlick is actually probably before Acanthostega in the list. And then they both give rise to eventually Ichthyostega. And Ichthyostega is a good candidate for essentially, you know, the, the fish-like amphibian that can actually start to move onto the land and conquer the continents. Okay, so the next problem is, is all right, so we have organisms like Ichthyostega, they can make it onto the land and they are, they're off, they're moving around doing their thing. So as amphibians produce uh, gelatinous eggs, they obviously need to return to water to lay them. So just think of frogs. Frogs are a good example. Frogs have to lay their eggs in water. And obviously this somewhat limits the ability of tetrapods to colonize land. They always have to be near water, or at least they have to be near water, you know, during times of when they have to uh, breed. <clears throat> But obviously, they also have to be uh, near water because obviously amphibians have a bit of a problem when it comes to drying out. So, you know, if you, you know, I'm sure you know, if you ever picked up a frog or a toad, you'll know they have a kind of slimy feel to them. And that's because they, co you know, they, they cover themselves in a layer of slime in order to stop themselves drying out. <coughs> Very sorry. <clears throat> sorry about that. So this layer of slime protects them, but the layer of slime will only work for so long and eventually they'll have to return to the water for a short while. So this means that amphibians find it very, very difficult to move away from bodies of water for any prolonged period. 
So the appearance of the amniote egg in the late Carboniferous changes this. So the amniote egg is the kind of egg that we have when you think of a chicken egg. So you have a sac, which is full of the liquid, which is the amnion. And within that sac, you have a yolk sac for food and a waste sac. And it's within that little confined area that the embryo will develop. So a fully formed but miniature reptile would therefore emerge from the amniote egg and therefore you bypass the need for a larval stage. So once again, going back to frogs, when you think about frogs, well, the frog, it, the frog lays the frog spawn in water and the frog spawn will eventually turn to tadpoles. The tadpoles will slowly develop legs and then those organisms will eventually become large enough to the point where they can move on to land as fully formed frogs. So essentially you need an intermediate larval stage to get from the frog spawn to a fully grown frog. In the case of the amniotech, on the other hand, what happens is, is you, you have a fully formed um, organism come out of the egg, but essentially it's a miniature version of the parent. And so obviously the parent then has to stay around, in most cases, for long enough to allow the organism to safely develop into a full-grown adult. So this is a very, very important step that occurs in evolution. So the amphibians are on the whole relatively limited because they produce these soft eggs that don't have a hard outer shell to protect them. Now as we move from the amphibians to the reptiles on the other hand, the reptiles have the amniote egg. And that means essentially when they lay an egg they have a you know a little self-contained environment in which the young can safely develop. And so this means that all of a sudden the reptiles when they appear can push out of push out into environments into which the amphibians could not easily move. Okay, so this obviously brings us on to the reptiles. So, <coughs> excuse me. So reptiles are separated from amphibians based on their skin, their skull structure, their jawbone design, ear location, and limb and uh, vitreal construction. So there are lots of morphological differences between reptiles and amphibians that allow us to separate them. So we see the first reptile, an organism called Westlovina, and it, appear, it, it appears in the middle Carboniferous rocks from Scotland. And although there are uh, large differences, there are also strong similarities between amphibians and reptiles, which suggest they had a common uh, ancestor. And we believe the split between reptiles and amphibians probably occurred somewhere in the early to middle Carboniferous. So, you know, we had these very early primitive uh, ichthyostega like organisms make them move onto the land and then you know very not long after that you know as we move towards the end of the devonian into the carboniferous this divergence occurs we get one branch going off to give us the amphibians and another branch going off to give us the reptiles so the early reptiles were small and agile and they're loosely grouped together into a group that we refer to as the uh, protothyroids So during the Permian, the reptiles diversified and began to outcompete the amphibians. And reptiles succeeded because, number one, they had more advanced reproduction. They had the amniote egg on their side. Number two, they had more advanced jaws and teeth. Number three, they had tougher skin and scales that prevented desiccation. So, you know, if you ever felt a, an, an animal like a, a snake or, a, you know, a an alligator or something like that, you'll know that their skin essentially is, you know, very, very smooth, but it's very, very hard. It's very, very, you know, not bony is the wrong word, but very leathery. And so that's how reptiles got round drying out. Instead of instead of covering themselves in a layer of slime like an amphibian will, reptiles decided the best way to do it was just simply to cover themselves in a really heavy, leathery skin. And that would help to stop the organism from drying out. And another major difference between the reptiles and the amphibians is that the reptiles could, on the whole, move faster, which obviously is very, very important, especially when it comes to things like hunting. So the uh, plicosaurs, or the thinned back reptiles, evolved from these very early reptiles uh, during the late Carboniferous, and they were the dominant reptile group by the early Permian, with both herbivores and carnivores in that group. <coughs> Excuse me. So uh, many plicosaurs had what referred to as sails on their back, and the sails were formed uh, by spines coming off the vertebrae, so the parts of the spinal column, and there was skin in between these spines. So essentially the back looked like it had this, this giant sail on it. Now the purpose of the sail is uncertain. This, they could have been for defense, so you know, 
they could have formed some kind of you know defensive mechanism maybe the spines on the back stopped other animals from attacking them somehow they could have been for mating displays they could have simply been for intimidation having the the sail on the back makes them look a lot larger than they really are and therefore you know animals might be less likely to attack them or they could be for temperature regulation it would allow the the reptile to pump blood into the sail in the morning and you know let it face the sun so that you know during the morning that the sun could hit the sail heat up the blood the organism could the uh, the plicosaur could warm up faster or conversely if it needs to cool down it could go into a shaded area it could once again pump the blood into the sail and because it's in the shaded area it would allow the heat to exit the body via the sail into the surrounding air with more efficiency so it could cool down faster so this is what the, the basic plicosaur looks like. So this is uh, Demetrodon, one of the classic examples. This is a carnivore. So you can see they have the verte vertebral column running on here. So the spine's running down there. And you can see coming off the vertebrae, you have these long bony spines. And in between them, you have these this membrane. So you, this is the sail here. Okay. Now, you can see that the legs are sticking out the side. But it does have the capacity to move more efficiently than your average amphibian. So you can see he's taken a pretty major step forward. So before we just discuss the final part of the presentation, we're going to do today's uh, code word. And today's code word, code word is wizard, as in the people that cast spells. So I repeat, today's code word is wizard. Okay, so the plicosaurs died out during the Permian. And they were succeeded by a group called the Thrapsids. And the Thrapsids are important because they are more mammal-like than your average reptile. And they evolved from the carnivorous Plicosaur lineage. So the, this group of organisms that included Demetrodon gave rise to the Thrapsids. And the Thrapsids are eventually going to give rise to the mammals. So the Thrapsids ranged in size from small dog-like uh, organisms all the way up to medium-sized organisms that would have been about the size of a cow. So many of them uh, display uh, mammalian features, or features like few skulls, enlarged jawbones, differentiated teeth, that's a very important one, and the placement of the limbs under the body. That's important for increasing movement speed. And you'll see a picture in a second of a frapsid where you'll see the limbs are no longer sticking out to the side, they're now actually under the body, which makes them far more efficient. We also have some evidence to suggest that thrapsids may have been endothermic. They might have been warm-blooded. And this <coughs> would have allowed the thrapsids to move into higher latitude areas that organisms that require, you know, uh, the sun to keep them warm, like the plicosaurs, may not have been able to. So we know that the Thrapsids made up about 90% of known reptiles at the end of the Permian, so they were a very successful group. However, they were hit very, very hard by the Permo-Trias mass extinction, with about 66% of reptiles and amphibians becoming extinct. So the group really did take a, a, a bit of a beating at the end of the Permo-Trias the, the mass extinction. So we see that dinosaurs, on the other hand, well, dinosaurs evolve from a group of organisms which are called the thecodonts, and that's a family of uh, crocodilian-like reptiles that aren't related to the thrapsids. So there's a, a branching of the um, of the reptiles. One branch goes off to give us to give us the uh, <coughs> excuse me, the uh, crocodile-like uh, thecodonts, whilst another branch goes off to give us the more more mammalian thrapsids. So you can see, this is the basic body design here. You can see the limbs, they're no longer sticking out directly at the side. You can see they've begun to move underneath the body. And that's very, very helpful because, you know, it, number one, because they're no longer sticking out at the side, it means it won't move like a crocodile. If you've ever seen a crocodile walking, it has a kind of a wiggle to it, yeah? Compare that to something like, I don't know, a dog or a cat. The limbs are underneath the body. It can move with a far more, what we would consider to be mammalian gait. And so this is essentially a very important shift. The other thing is that we begin to see differentiated teeth. So in our mouths, we have incisors, carnivores. Uh, so let's try that again. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> uh, we have incisors, molars, and the third type of tooth, which I can't remember right now. Give me one second. I'm going to pause the presentation. Okay, good old Google. Uh, incisors, molars, and canines. <laughs> 
of course. That was the missing tooth I couldn't remember. So yeah, so we have differentiated teeth. Each of those three different types of teeth have their own uses. And we begin to see the differentiation of the teeth within the thrapsids, and that's another strong indicator that this is the group that's eventually going to give rise to the mammals. Okay, so that's it for vertebra, uh, vertebra, uh, vertebrates during the, uh, the late Paleozoic. <coughs> I really am very sorry about the coughing. And I'm very sorry for the fact that I, you might have noticed the presentation is a little bit choppy because I had to pause it several times because I had coughing fits. I've got my, one of my kids has made me sick. I apologize for that. Anyway, uh, remember the code word for today's presentation is wizard. Please make sure you write that down for the code word test. Okay, so uh, take care everyone and keep an eye out for the next presentation, please.